now should I turn this on? You don't know. So um, I right usually here. do. I think he turns I think he turns you on and on. But then we get him. I'm not here to make it. We're going with it. That would, that would be the one. Oh, well, and yourself. said we only had a five minute intro.
Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Abbey Reformed Church on this sunny Sunday morning. After yesterday, it's great to see the sun. And whether you are worshiping online or you're worshiping in person, we welcome you and we are glad you're here. And we hope you find our service meaningful this morning. Have a few announcements this morning. Over here on the table in the sanctuary are some baked goodies and other items that are left from the basement sale. If you'd be interested in purchasing any of those, they are marked with the prices on them, and there is a basket there to put in your money for that. So if you'd like to take that, please feel free to do that. The other announcement I wanted to make is to remind everybody that the Huntington Kiwanis Club is selling blueberries this year again as a fundraiser. We have a 10-pound box of blueberries. They're really nice. They are $30 for a 10-pound box. The orders are due on June 15th. We also have a sign-up sheet over there on the front table. And if you have any questions about that, you can see myself or Bill Frazier. We'd be happy to help you out with that. My last announcement is that it does give me great pleasure to announce that this coming Tuesday, May 10th, Louise Heberling, who is one of our longtime members here at the Abbey Church, will be celebrating her 98th birthday. So if you would be interested in sending Louise a card, I'm sure she'd enjoy hearing from you. Please see Ann Kuhn. She does have her address and definitely um, would be nice to bless her with a great amount of cards. Are there any prayer requests this morning? No? Okay. Well, I'd like to remind everybody that no matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at the Abbey Reform United Church of Christ. We worship together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Please join me in our call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessing and honor is yours, O God. Glory to God forever. Alleluia. God is our present, is present to guide our journey and eager to forgive us when we go astray. Therefore, in humility and faith, let us confess our sins against God and neighbor. Holy God, we confess that we have strayed from your paths of right relationship and peace, and we have dishonored you, ourselves, and your creation. We repent of these hurtful ways. Forgive us, we pray, as we learn to forgive others and guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. God's mercy overflows as a healing spring to cleanse us of our offenses. Therefore, know that you are forgiven and receive new life in Christ.
This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 13 to 31. Now when they saw the, saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So they discussed the matter with one another. They said, what will we do with them? For it is obvious to all who live in Jerusalem that a notable sign has been done through them. We cannot deny it. But to keep it from spreading further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in God's sight to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we not, cannot keep from speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them again, they left them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all of them had praised God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing had been performed was more than 40 years old. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look at their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal in signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. May God add his blessing to the reading of this scripture this morning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, <clears throat> has anybody else noticed a few things are changing in the world in which we live? No, you missed it, right? Huh? You missed it. Well, this morning I want to talk to you a little bit about some of those changes and some things that I think that would be very helpful for you and I as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ today. When I lived in California, I had an opportunity to be in a rather odd situation. Uh, I was asked one time to come and, and teach in the Westlake Village High School, our church that we started there. We started in the city of Westlake Village, California. And I'm not sure why they asked me, but nevertheless, I think it was because we had some teenagers there. And so I went in, and they wanted me to teach in the area of marriage. And uh, they told me, and they said, look, you can't come in and quote the Bible and those things. And I said, well, that's all right. I said, um, if uh, we accidentally actually teach some biblical principles, that's all right, isn't it? Well, yeah, as long as you don't quote the Bible. I said, well, good. So I went in. We spent a couple of very, very good class times. And I remember one time I was trying to help the students understand <clears throat> that finding the perfect life companion should not be about looks. Certainly, that's part of what happens to us and when we are teenagers in school. We want to find somebody that we perceive as good-looking. But So what I did is I told them that since uh, I had been a teenager and now was growing a little bit older, I realized, looking in the mirror one day, that one of my ears was just a little bit bigger than the other. Then I told them my hair took an awful lot of work to look this good. 
And it was about that time that one boy in the back stood up and he said, yeah, and your nose. What about your big nose? <clears throat> and I realized that things weren't quite the same as they had been when I grew up in school. <clears throat> and by the way, please don't stare at my big nose for the remainder of the sermon this morning, if you would. Many of us who are a bit older remember that we had a great amount of focus on the three R's when we were in school, only one of which, of course, started with an R, which was always rather profound to me coming from teachers, but nevertheless, reading, writing, and arithmetic were kind of the real focal points. I have come to the conclusion that in all probability, along with those three, we should have really been majoring on the responsibility for our personal actions and attitudes, our reasoning skills, so we might have a little bit of common sense and wisdom and respect for others, those in authority, our parents and and police officers and whatnot. But as we read through the book of Acts, as I look at the book of Acts and I try to bring it into uh, its totality, in what happened during this first century church, I was struck one day as I was kind of doing an overview that while the book of Acts is extremely exhilarating, I mean, what what I have wanted to live in those days with, you know, no technology, no, I, I just don't think I would have wanted to live in those days. But I think the exhilaration that was taking place within the Church of Jesus Christ in those early days would have been most exciting, would have been some place that I could have really settled in and enjoyed my life. The book of Acts focuses on two main characters, first half on Peter, the Apostle Peter, and the last half on the conversion and the life of the Apostle Paul. I think sometimes as we watch them minister to two main people groups, or basically how the Jews perceived the world. There were folks who were Jewish, and there were those who weren't. And that's basically how they perceived the world, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Acts of the Apostles is is a trip through the expansion of the New Testament church. Now, one of the things that should strike you immediately as you are part of a church in 2022 is how rapidly it grew. Uh, When you stop to think that probably within two years, the church in Jerusalem may have had over 18,000 members. I mean, we just kind of sit back and, wow, what would that have been like? Well, it would have been difficult, most difficult. We think sometimes it's difficult because we struggle to get a crowd And I can assure you that it's a struggle when you have a crowd. (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of work involved to try to first accomplish it, number two, to try to deal with it. I'm convinced that one of the things that helped the New Testament church, not setting aside the work of the Holy Spirit and God himself, I do not want to minimize that, but God is going to do his work, as will the Holy Spirit, It's us that needs motivation. Would you not agree with that? You don't need to come home today and say, okay, God, you need to get with it, all right? Uh, You're not going to go home today and say, Holy Spirit, you're just not doing your job. No, we probably need to go home today and take a look at ourselves in the mirror. So I'd like to just focus on what was happening in the life of those first century Christ followers. Now, if you had thought before you came today that the guest minister was going to go through the book of Acts, most of you would have stayed home because you got other things planned for later on, but please, it won't take us that long. I'm convinced that there are some foundational things that we can find in the New Testament church in Jerusalem that would help us to really understand a little bit about what happens when a church is totally focused on the foundational things that God has given us the responsibility for. Now, first of all, we always have to remember that the church, whatever those foundations are, has to fit in the culture in which it exists. 
I did a study when I took a church down in the Baltimore area, and I asked the congregation, I said, are we ministering to the people who live here? And the answer was yes. And I said, well, then let's do a little survey. And I went back to the previous uh, census, and we looked through that census, and then we took a census of our congregation. Our congregation was so radically different than what our community was that in reality we were not ministering to our community. Oh, it did one day. But the community had changed around us. Most of the people were drive-ins from 10, 15, 20 minutes away. They were no longer walk-ins from across the street. Uh, they were not a reflection, either in, in, in a racial reflection, a social reflection, a financial reflection of the community in which we live. And I said, we are still doing things to keep the congregation we've got, but there's nothing we're doing to try to reach the community that's here. And so we made some adjustments and changes along the way. So culture's an important thing. Just like, just like yeast in, in dough, in bread dough, that once it's placed and in, 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 in focused in a certain area in the bread, if it's done correctly, it will eventually permeate the bread. So somebody along the way, some people, individuals, have got to say, within my church there needs to be some yeast. I need to be that yeast. Maybe somebody else needs to be that yeast because those foundational beliefs, those foundational things that happened in those churches really were the things that made them grow. And here's something, before we just touch on those things this morning, here's something that's important. If you were to take a study of the church in Jerusalem and then go out to churches that Paul started, like in Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus and all of those places, you would find these same foundational truths in every single culture where he had gone. Everyone. They would be present. Well, we have the newest technology today. We use it. I think we should use it effectively. We have to always be reminded of the fact that we have to have a foundation and a framework in which that technology operates, or the technology just means that we've got the latest gadget. If we are not actually using it to establish the foundation, then it's just a gadget. And just like a solid foundation of the three or the six R's are necessary for a good education, the five E's that we find in Acts are absolutely important also. First of all, the first couple of E's basically are what our outward look has to be about. How we look outside these doors and through these windows and see the community around us. Then the last three are about our inward look. How do we view the people who already come here or who are coming here? How do we do that? And in the book of Acts, the apostles declared the supremacy of Christ and salvation. And even when they were threatened to stop preaching, as the passage that Chris read to us today, they boldly declare that they would obey God rather than man, and they would not stop preaching, no matter what the threats were. And back in those days, the threats were, mm, they were pretty tough. You've got to remember, all the Romans cared was that they had peace. That's all that mattered. They didn't care anything about Christianity. They didn't care anything about Judaism. But when they started to fuss at one another, the only thing that the Romans cared was there be peace. And Christianity was the new guy on the block causing all the problems. So you knew who was going to get put in jail. You knew who they were going to try to come down hard on. Let's get the new guy on the block off the block, and these Jews will just be fine and everything will go back to normal. So this is a precarious situation. But the Bible says that when they went away from the threats... Instead of praying how to get out of the trial that may follow or the consequences, what did they pray for? More boldness. <laughs> they said, God, help us not to be afraid of them. Help us to just keep on doing what we're doing. And I think today 
what we need to do as a church, whatever the name is on the outside, no matter what the liturgy may be in preparation for the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, whatever that is, we have to say to ourselves, we will not be intimidated. We will not be told that we cannot preach that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life for the salvation of the world. We won't. It's too important. So what are these five E's? Well, first of all, they had an outward look, and that had to do with engaging and evangelism. I think we talk a lot about evangelism. I think we feel real good when we support a missionary. We can kind of say to ourselves, well, see, I'm doing evangelism through this person over there. But God keeps coming back and and just whispering in our ear or yelling from the housetops, whichever the case may be, yeah, but what about your neighbors? That missionary isn't talking to your next-door neighbor over the back fence. He's not talking to the person you work with or the person that serves your food. How are you engaging and evangelizing? Peter engaged the crowd publicly on the day of Pentecost. Now, this is after, when approached by a crowd, he denied Christ. This is a major change in Peter's life. The power that the Holy Spirit gave him to be bold is just astronomical because he goes out basically in front of some of the same crowd of people and boldly declares that he knows Christ and who Christ is and who crucified Christ. Peter engaged groups of people publicly in the temple, individually on the streets, and also privately in their homes. To Peter, all of Jerusalem was his mission field. Nothing, no no area was exempt or, or off limits to Peter. Paul comes along and trusts Christ as his Savior and and finally realizes that all that he's trying to do to stamp out the church, he needs to be doing to try to help the church because Jesus Christ literally is the Messiah. And all of a sudden, Paul engages individuals, groups, publicly. He does it in every venue. He even says, he said, we need to be getting the gospel out every way and in every moment to every person we can possibly reach. So he engaged these groups all over the known world, as a matter of fact. But what has happened, and it's easy to happen to all of us, I even find it sometimes now in retirement to kind of think to myself, ah, you're kind of retired now. Don't, don't get so excited about this stuff anymore. Just go home, prop your feet up, ride your motorcycle, do the things you like to do, and, and just don't get so excited about this anymore. And God keeps coming back and saying, you know, your heart's beating, right? Yeah. Your mouth still works. Yep. You can still think, can't you? Uh-huh. He says, then you're not done. There's still work to be done. We cannot allow ourselves to come to the conclusion that this is ministry for apostles, pastors, and missionaries. For the most part, they are not responsible for your family and for your friends and your neighbors. You are. The Bible says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, something that I want you to notice, if you would, with me. On that great day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And if you have your Bible, or at least make a mental note of this, all except the apostles were forced to scatter throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Jesus had said that the place the gospel was to be taken was Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. They had gotten real comfortable in Jerusalem And so God allowed persecution to arise, and they decided they would get away from the persecution. To go where? Judea and Samaria. (laughs) I I love the way God works sometimes. Just from the background, says, "Eh, come on, go on, get out there, go on, go on, go do it. Now, I want you to notice something. Acts 8.1 says, all except the apostles. Don't forget that. 
because as we read Acts 8, 4, now those who had been forced to scatter, stop. Who? All those but the apostles. How many apostles do we have here today? So you are, and I are all the except, right? And what did they do? Well, they went around proclaiming the good news of the Word of God. You see, they believed in engaging people. They believed in engaging them in conversations that they would slowly move towards spiritual subjects that would ultimately give them the opportunity to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to their friends, to their family, and to their neighbors. Now, why did they do that? Well, in part, because they took Peter's admonition to heart. In 1 Peter 3, Paul, excuse me, Peter writes, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. So they engaged all of these people in their life. They engaged their culture. They engaged... Uh, people in intentional conversations with the end purpose in mind that they would present the gospel to them. They didn't walk up to people and say, hey, I want to tell you how to go to heaven when you die. No, they engaged them in conversations. They began to talk. They began to talk about things that God was doing in their life. And the end product was people started to say, hmm, let me ask you a question about that. And they were ready to give answers. They were prepared to give the most simple of witnesses, just like the man who'd been cured of his blindness. All he knew about what had happened was, I used to be blind, and I'm not now. That was the big witness. But that's all he knew. He told what he knew. I remember when I was first asked a little bit about some changes in my life by some of the people that I graduated high school with, and I said, look, I I don't know all the details about the transformation that's taken place in my life. I can only tell you one thing. On January the 4th, 1966, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, and nothing's been the same since. Things that I never thought anything about, I think about now. Things that that I would do then, I won't do now. Things just changed. Things that I would have never done before, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing now. Everything's changed. That was, that was my big witness at one time in my life. Or you can move on to get a little deeper into what happened and explain it like the Apostle Paul did in Athens with all the philosophers and the professors that gathered up on Mars Hill. But somewhere between that most simple of witness to the ability to defend the great theological doctrines of the faith is where you and I fit. And it is the ability to get involved in conversations engaging and evangelizing on a multitude of subjects so that we can give a gospel presentation and tell people how to trust Jesus. You say, well, you know, that's just a little bit embarrassing. That's a little bit, you know. Yeah, it is. Sure it is. Do you want me to tell you what else is embarrassing? When you stand up with your Steelers jersey on amongst a bunch of people from the other team, Do you know what's embarrassing? To have a bumper sticker for your favorite presidential candidate. That's embarrassing. All of those things put us into a class and sometimes pit us against others. My son Philip, who lives up in Scranton area right now, he manages the Hobby Lobby up in Dixon City, used to live up in Boston. Steelers fans are not well liked in Boston. (laughs) At Lowe's, where he worked, he always wore, in cold weather, his Steelers jacket, his Steelers jersey, and his Steelers cap. Now that's pushing it a little bit because I just think he wanted to aggravate people and we should never come to the place of wanting to give the gospel to people just to, you know, stick it to... But the point I'm trying to make is simply this. 
we don't take the philosophy of blending into the background on almost any other team we belong to. You buy your stuff from Huntington High School and go on vacation and wear it proudly. You go to places that aren't Steelers fans and wear your Steelers shirt. Why do you do that? You want people to identify you with that group. You want them to know who you are. Why in all the world don't we do that? Why is it all of a sudden taboo with Christianity? Why is it all? Why are we the oddballs all of a sudden if we wear a Jesus first pin or if we, if, if we talk about Christ? or I have, I have ball caps that I wear all the time. I was in the United States Navy and they have stuff all over about the Navy and stuff. The plastered across the back is forgiven. And I have people ask me all the time, what's that mean? Well, I'm forgiven. What do you mean you're forgiven? What'd you do? <laughs> I'm forgiven by a holy God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I think it's sad, but most Christians cannot put into an understandable group of relevant words what happened to them when they trusted Christ as their Savior. Most use words that unchurched people don't even understand, give their testimony and disconnected thoughts that doesn't have any direction to it to help somebody to get from point A to point B. Some of it is so bad it's almost painful and unintelligible. But in Acts 5 it says, every day in the temple and from house to house, they, meaning all of them, continued to teach and preach the message that Jesus is the Messiah. And when told that you can't preach anymore, here was their response. We are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. They have almost a completely different philosophy, as most of us do. Our tendency is we are not able or willing to speak about the things that we've heard and seen. And if we're to be the people God wants us to be, that has to change. So that's the outward look. That's the engaging and the evangelizing part. God never called us just to set up shop on a street corner someplace and hang out a sign and figure that any time we opened the doors that people would just flock in. No, they won't. No, they won't. And if you're waiting for that to change, it's only going to get worse. We have got to be engaging and evangelizing. Then there's the inward look. All right, people come. They've trusted Christ their Savior. They're part of the church. Now what? What was the foundation? Well, the inward look then was encouraging and exhorting and edifying. All a bunch of words, some of which you may not fully understand. But give me just a couple of minutes and... Maybe you'll be able to get this into perspective. Webster defines encouragement as inspiring people with courage, spirit, or hope to spur on to attempt to persuade. Encouraging in the New Testament is used over and over again. Paul told the people at Thessalonica, he has said, encourage each other just in the same way you're already doing. Be an encouragement. There was one gentleman whose name was Joseph in the New Testament church at the end of our passage, by the way, in Acts 4. And they nicknamed him Barnabas, which is the son of encouragement. That's what his name meant. Can you imagine being such a standout in your church as an encourager that people say, man, I'm not calling you Joe anymore. Man, you're Barnabas. Boy, I want you to have the name of Barnabas because... Everybody comes in your presence, walks away encouraged, fired up, ready to, uh, I forget one preacher I used to listen to, he said, ready, ready to charge the gates of hell with a squirt gun if necessary. <laughs> Joseph gets the nickname, son of encouragement. I've been struck by how much encouragement these people must have needed in the days of Peter and the other apostles in the first century church. Somebody like Barnabas would have been such a gift. Life was hard, was difficult. Every single day it was difficult. 
And now that you were a Christian in the first century church, it was even more difficult. You needed people. You needed your church. You needed your church family. You needed them to help you to get through the day. Sometimes you needed them to even supply you with sustenance to get through the day. No matter what they had, no matter what they did, life just was not easy for them. Living a bunch, uh, amongst opposition and threats and persecution, so much uncertainty, encouragement needed to be bold, it needed to be needed to persevere, it needed to fight against, help them to fight against sin, to help them stay faithful, not fight among themselves in the process. They needed encouragement to preach the gospel, stay faithful to sound doctrine. It was essential for the life of the church in the first century. But it's fascinating. When the writer of Hebrews scrolled down what he had to say as God led him through each word, he wrote in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, he said, you need to encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? Well, he had talked extensively about the day when Jesus Christ would come back to this earth. Now, nobody knew what that day was back then. And by the way, nobody knows when that day is today. But do the math, folks. We're over 2,000 years closer. Every day, we're one day closer to whenever that day is. And he said, you know, you need to encourage each other in the first century. But he said, you're going to find out you need to be encouraging one another even more the closer you get to the day when Jesus will return. The stakes are high. People are ready to give up. They want to walk away from institutions that they feel are failing. We desperately need each other. And we need to encourage each other like they did in the New Testament church. We're 2,000 years closer to that day. And the need of encouragement has multiplied significantly. The second thing they were doing, they were exhorting. Now, this may not be a word that you've ever used before, but let me give you a couple of New Testament examples, and then we'll talk about it. Hebrews says, But exhort one another each day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may become hardened by sin's deception. Now, what he means by while it is called today it is long as time exists. Because you understand when Jesus comes back and God destroys this earth and we go into eternity, you, by the way, if you have an Apple Watch, you might as well go ahead and give it to somebody before you leave because you're not going to need it where you're going. <laughs> no time. He says, exhort one ever one another every single day because the day's going to come when there won't be any time any longer. He went on to say, let us think of ways to motivate, and that word is encourage what we were talking about, motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but exhort. Now we're talking about this word that goes a little beyond encouraging one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing close. The apostle uses them both together. As after the disturbance, and, and excuse me, in Acts 20, after the disturbance had end or, uh, excuse me, en ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after exhorting them and saying farewell, he left to go to Macedonia after he had gone through those regions and spoken many words of encouragement to the believers there. He came to Greece. Exhortation is defined as ex inciting by argument or advice strongly urging to give warnings or advice. So let me explain it to you like this. You do something good in the church where I go, and a multitude of people are going to walk up to you and say, man, good job. You, you just blessed me by the song, by the reading, by the sermon, by the teaching, by the, and on and on and on the list goes. Lots of people will come up, and they mean it sincerely. That's encouragement. That's encouragement. And when you fall down, 
and you do something really, really bad, that same per- group of people is going to come up and they're going to say, let me encourage you and let me exhort you and see if I can help you so that won't ever happen again in your life. Or you understand, maybe you probably shouldn't be thinking and acting that way. You say, whoa, I like that encouragement stuff, but that exhortation thing, you know. Well, I don't know about you, but I need them both. I need to be corrected once in a while. I need somebody to love me enough to put our friendship at risk, to sit down and say, you know, Christians doing that kind of thing, it just really is bad for the name of Christ. So they exhorted one another. They went one step beyond encouragement, and they came to one another and tried to incite by argument or advice, strongly urge, giving warnings and advice. It all comes from the word parakaleo, which is the word that we use for the Holy Spirit, because that's his job inside our hearts. But now, as he works on our hearts, he talks about people coming into our lives to encourage and exhort us. And so now God works on us from the inside, and God works on us from the outside to try to help each other along. Do you care enough about me whether I, my whole life comes apart because of some sin that I'm involved in? Do you care enough about me about that? I hope you do. And I hope if you become aware, you'll call me up and say, Tim, let's go have a cup of coffee. We need each other like that. We need one another to urge one another to pursue some course of conduct or perspective, looking, and it's always, by the way, this word is always used looking to the future, not to the past. It's not trying to correct the problems of the past, it's trying to help people from falling on their face in the future. And then lastly, and I'll close with this, edifying. We don't use that word much very often anymore, but if I took you down into Huntington and I said to you, you know, let's walk around Huntington. You're new to the area, you don't know it. I want to point out to you some of the most unique edifices in Huntington, Pennsylvania than you'll find anywhere else in our state. And I'd take you to places like our courthouse, some of the wonderful, beautiful old homes that have been around. What would I be showing you? Buildings. The word edify means to build. And you find it all through the New Testament in the original languages. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage each other and build each other up. Romans says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Paul said, you know, I get to bragging a little bit about my authority. They, they always wanted to say, well, Paul, you're not really an apostle. And Paul says, well, yes, I am. Jesus called me on the Damascus Road. And they get in a little argument. But he, say, he says here, he said, even if I boast a little bit too much about my authority, which the Lord gave me for building you up. He said, God didn't give me my authority in the church to tear people down. God gave me that authority to try to build them up. And that's one of the things we have to be careful of, even after, as we get authority. And it doesn't matter whether that authority is at work or at home or in church uh, or on the job, wherever that might be. God gives authority to build people up, not so that we can tear them down. And that's what God wants us to use that authority for. Because if not, and our pride gets the best of it, oh, I'm the boss, you know, uh, that thing goes awry pretty quick. Edification is building. It's the act of building. It is the sense in the New Testament where it's only used figuratively. Figuratively, excuse me. It's never used for a real, genuine building. Only used figurative. It is the sense of spiritual growth. Many churches and congregations are building buildings, but they're not building people. And when they build buildings... And they gain people because of the buildings, and they're not building people, the buildings will not last long. You see things in the newspaper at churches that have collapsed completely, that once led, excuse me, once ran thousands of people, 
but they weren't building people. They weren't exhorting. They weren't encouraging. They weren't doing the things that the church from within needs to do, and eventually the whole thing fell apart. I know of church buildings for sale in other parts of the United States that once ran eight, nine, ten thousand people that are just set, setting and vacant. Akron Baptist Temple that used to be one of the largest churches in the United States reaching and touching lives of people now. The roof caved in four days ago. Nothing left. Nothing left. Don't get me wrong. We've got to build buildings. No question about it. But we have to concentrate, concentrate on building up one another. And it's not just encouraging, oh, you're doing a great job. Occasionally it's gone to somebody and saying, you know, you're not doing such a great job. Let me work with you. Let's, let's, let's try to do this together and become better at what we do. Let's come together as a congregation and say, okay, have we lost our purpose? Where do we need to go? What do we need to change? Who, uh, how can we build each other up so we can do the job that God's called us to do? Buildings are tools. They're not monuments. When they become monuments, we stop doing in, inside what we need to do. Everybody's walking away like you do in a monument or museum. They're going, shh, don't talk very loudly. Don't say too much. You'll disturb the people that used to come here, that are buried over here, or that means that that was from that family, or on and on and on. Instead of shouting from the housetops that Jesus saves just like he always did. That's why our building should be built for change, with the ability to function and flow as a tool, not as a monastery in a museum. I have to remind myself of these things every single day. We can't get away from them. We can't just brush them under the carpet and say, oh, it'll all work out. I think the New Testament church was blessed of God in a miraculous way because of five things that they did. They engaged people in conversation, intentional conversation, so that they could evangelize them and tell them about Jesus. I think when they came to church, they encouraged one another. When encouragement didn't work, they exhorted one another. And everybody in the church was being built up, trying to find their gifts and talents and to put them to use within the church. I believe that with all my heart. I worked at it for 50-some years, and I'm still trying to do it. I think that's so important. Now, one last thing, and I'm going to pray. When you're old like me, you want to think it's all over. I did my part. Well, let me tell you what my part isn't anymore. You're going to have camp. I'm not coming. (laughs) I don't sleep with kids out on the ground someplace to do camp anymore. You're going to have a basketball leg. I ain't running. I can barely walk. I can't do the running part anymore. (laughs) Some of, the, some of the rest of you is a little bit younger are going to have to do that. You want somebody that's acquired a little bit of wisdom along the way? Eh, a little bit along the way. You want somebody that can maybe give you some advice about doing a few things? I probably have a little bit of that for you. I know some of you got in a place you can't do it anymore. I know that. And it isn't going to get better. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and God's going to say, eh, I think I'll give them a 20-year-old body so they can do all the things they used to do. I don't know what I'd do with a 20-year-old body, to be quite honest with you. (laughs) But I want to be honest with you, too. You get to be 70, 75, 80, 90. Somebody asked me, said, what are you still doing? I said, I got a mouth and I got a brain. As long as I got those two, I can do something. Dear Heavenly Father, today, you, God, have spoken to my heart many times over and over and over again from these passages. You've challenged me in powerful ways about what was happening in the New Testament church, about what happened in those first years among the people. 
their commitment and dedication to make sure that everybody in their neighborhood knew about Jesus. I know things have changed and our society is different. But Father in heaven, help us to figure out a way that we can get back to those foundational principles, both in reaching out and reaching in. We beg you and pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayers. prayers. Lord's prayer together, please. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning I also want to announce, and I do apologize, I forgot, I'd like to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Thank you for the many ways that you touch our lives and um, all the things that you do. Also want to let you know that this morning we are collecting for our Good Samaritan Fund, which is a fund designed to support our child that's on the board up here to my left, your right. And also want to let you know that offering plates can be found at the entrance of the sanctuary, or offerings can be dropped by the church into the slot on the door nearest Moore on 6th Street. Checks can be mailed, or you can give electronically on the Abbey's website. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. And can you please join me in the prayer dedication of gifts and self? Holy God, divine shepherd, you anoint us with the oil of gladness. Your love overflows our hearts. Accept our offering for the good of the world as we joyfully give thanks for our life in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Well, today in this Mother's Day 2022, go forth to follow paths of righteousness. Go forth to follow the path of peace. And may God's goodness and his mercy follow you as you serve the risen Lord. May Christ the Good Shepherd bless and guide you this day and always. God bless.